for our Criminals, Cutthroats and Convicts Part 4 special of our Van Diemen's Demons with Martin Cash. Martin Cash was born in Enniscorthy Island in the Wexford area in 1808. We know Enniscorthy from our Irish Rebellion episode where it was really the area in Ireland where the battle scene took place for the Irish Rebellion in Ireland in 1798. So it was kind of 10 years after the Irish Rebellion in Enniscorthy, Martin Cash was born. So that kind of atmosphere may have still been around at the time. He was born to wealthy parents and had quite a comfortable childhood. We find that he gets mixed up with a, a woman from another part of Enniscorthy. They say it's an obscure part, so perhaps she wasn't the kind of woman that his parents wanted him to find. Cash and this woman go into business in hat making and use quite a large amount of his parents' money until his mother puts a stop to it. This is assuming that Cash is around between 15 and 20 at this time he meets this woman and starts this business so he really doesn't have any real business sense possibly other than what he's been shown by his father and mother. Now Cash gets in trouble with the law when he goes to a house and finds that the woman of his affections is with another man and having a gun with him shoots that man. Apparently he gets him in the buttocks. The man doesn't die, but as a result, Martin Cash is sent to Australia for a term of seven years. This is 1828, and he has arrived on board the Marcus of Huntley with 170 other convicts in the February of 1828. On arrival, he is assigned to a Mr. G. Bowman of Richmond, who leases another farm on the Hunter River. The property was known as Archerfield, where is present day Walkworth. There is still Archerfield Road, but the property is no longer there. Cash worked on the property for several years as a stockman for George Bowman, and in 1834 was granted his freedom. We find in 1837 a John Boodle, who had a station on Liverpool Plains, asked Cash to assist him and his brother in branding some cattle. In the end, it is known that the cattle was stolen and after finding this out, Cash and his lover at the time, Bessie Clifford, fled to Hobart. Now, Bessie Clifford was the wife of a British army officer, so Bessie wasn't probably his best option. Over the next few years, he earned a living in a variety of jobs. While they were living in a place called Campbelltown, a man named Miller asked for a night's lodging. He mustn't have been of a very good character as suddenly the police were at their door. Miller fled leaving his swag. The police searched it and found a lot of stolen property and they arrested Martin for it. In Launceston on the 24th of March, 1840, Cash was convicted of possessing stolen goods and was sentenced to a work gang. He escaped from this work gang and was recaptured and sent to Port Arthur. Port Arthur was named after George Arthur who was the Lieutenant Governor of Van Diemen's Land we know from some of our previous episodes. In 1830 Port Arthur site started out as a timber station. From 1833 to 1853 it was an area where some of the worst criminals and convicts were sent to do some hard time. It was also supposed to be escape proof. However, Cash escaped from it by swimming from the peninsula to the mainland. But after five days, he was recaptured. So far, he's not doing too well at getting away and staying away. Cash pondered how to escape. On Boxing Day of 1842, he and two others, a Lawrence Kavanagh and a George Jones, both who'd absconded in the past, came up with a plan to get off the Port Arthur site. The three decided that they were going to make for Eagle Hawk Neck, which was a bit of a swim in shark infested waters. So they decided to leave at dusk so they wouldn't be noticed. They had to remove all their clothing so that they wouldn't be weighed down in the water and drown. So they piled them all up on their heads and swam like the clappers across 
heaven knows how long, oh, I'll find the details, how far they had to swim. Ones across the other side, none of them had any clothing, they'd lost them all, and they had to do the nudie run up the bank and try and find some clothes to hide their shame. Right, so not only was it the first recorded swim that anyone had ever done across or around from the Port Arthur site to Eagle Hawk Neck, but it was also a really long way to go. As we can see, it takes about four hours and two minutes. It's a 20k just up Arthur Highway. So to go all the way around, I mean swimming as well, and that's four hours walking up the highway. <laughs> so I can only assume it must have taken them eight hours maybe. It would have been a long time. Yeah, that's crazy. And nude. Several days later, after swimming across the bay and crawling past a sentry box, they were free. After sticking up numerous homesteads, the three men stumbled on the perfect career, bush ranging, and a perfect hideout. It was a cave atop Mount Dromedary, 24 kilometers from Hobart. At the base of Mount Dromedary lived a family who knew Cash, the three convicts rested there while the wife travelled to Hobart and brought back Bessie. Mmm, reuniting her with a man. This was now the base where they would take up the bush ranging career, robbing wealthy homesteads and gaining the name Cash and Co. They had the reputation for civility and non violence. There we go, another bush ranger who's not violent, <laughs> unless you mess with his woman. <laughs> now, when Bessie was taken prisoner in 1843 for possession of stolen goods, Cash responded like Matthew Brady did. He sent a letter to Lieutenant Governor John Franklin at the time. It read, Messrs. Cash and Co. begged to notify His Excellency, Sir John Franklin, that a very respectable person named Mrs. Cash is now falsely imprisoned in Hobart Town. And if said Mrs. Cash is not released forthwith and properly remunerated, we will, in the first instance, visit Government House and, beginning with Sir John, administer a wholesome lesson in the shape of a sound flogging, after which we will pay the same currency to all his followers. <laughs> Bessie was released on the 28th of April, but apparently it had nothing to do with that note. The police hoped that she would lead them to Cash & Co. On the 3rd of July, the gang committed its first highway robbery, bailing up Launceston passenger coach. It was the same day that two Aboriginal trackers arrived in Hobart. They were soon on the bushranger's trail. Things weren't going too well for the gang. A week later, Kavanagh's gun exploded. His arm was shattered and he was losing blood fast. So he decided to surrender. Bessie, meanwhile, had not returned from Hobart. Rumours were spreading fast that she had taken up with a man there. Cash became dangerously reckless, travelling to the colony's capital to confront Bessie himself. Before he had found her, however, he was recognised, and soon they were chasing him through the streets. Outside the old Commodore Inn, there was a constable, Peter Winstonley. He lunged at Cash, but the bush ranger shot him dead. Cash managed to fire one more shot, shattering one man's nose before he was knocked unconscious and captured. Cash and Kavanagh were both sentenced to death. Two days before they were due to be hung, both were told there had been a stay of execution. Kavanagh was transported to Norfolk Island, which had been recognised in 1825 after lying abandoned for 19 years. <laughs> Good old Norfolk's up and running again. Sarah Island was shut down in 1833 as they couldn't produce food on the island and malnutrition, dysentery and scurvy were often rampant among the convicts. So they decided to send all the convicts to Port Arthur from then on and also relocating them to Norfolk. Cash, however, was kept in a Hobart cell for 15 months, then sentenced to Norfolk Island. Perhaps they wanted to make sure that Cash and Kavanagh weren't together 
as before they'd escaped together and run amok. George Jones was less fortunate. Six months after his co-escapes were taken prisoner, Jones was hung in Hobart Town Jail. Cash arrived at Norfolk Island and he and Kavanagh were back together again. They couldn't keep these two apart. They were given 10 years. And you don't suppose that would have gone smoothly, do you? It wasn't long before drama was unfolding again. And it seems that the constables there confiscated the prisoners' billies. A billy was a metal bucket that they would fill with water and hold over a fire to boil. Once the water boiled, they'd remove the can from the fire and add some tea leaves to make their tea or brew their tea or any other hot beverage that they so chose. This obviously meant a lot to the convicts. This triggered a mutiny led by a William Westwood, AKA Jackie Jackie, who'd also been a bush ranger in New South Wales. This mutiny would come to be known as the Cooking Pot Uprising. It wasn't just the billies, but also cooking utensils. And this, as I've said, meant a lot to these convicts. They didn't have a lot and they wanted to hold on to what they had. Around 60 men were involved in the Cooking Pot Uprising, but as they couldn't ascertain out of the 500 convicts, which 60 were accountable, they ended up hanging the ringleaders which was about 27. From the details of this cooking pot uprising, it seems that Jackie Jackie could be part of the Van Diemen's demons himself. It looks as though he had also a long history of breaking out of jails and penal settlements, as well as bush ranging. And from the cooking pot uprising, he killed four men, one of which was sleeping, and he smashed his head in two with an ax. For 60 men to be involved in the uprising, it seems to me that these guys looking after them or the overseers were pretty nasty bastards anyway. So Jackie Jackie probably was doing what he felt to be the right thing and getting revenge. It was said that Kavanagh only played a small part in the mutiny, but he must have been singled out by someone as he was one of the 27 hung. Losing Kavanagh must have had a lasting effect on Cash, as we find that he spends the rest of his 10 years on his best behaviour. He was given some responsibility while at Norfolk Island and also allowed to take a wife. Cash married an Irish ticket of leave convict Mary Bennett. In the September, Cash received his ticket of leave and the pair immediately left for Hobart. In 1855, the couple had a son. In 1856, the very next year, Cash leaves Tasmania and moves to New Zealand, where he becomes a police officer. It could be that he couldn't find work in Tasmania, but has seemed to have found a job as a policeman in New Zealand, in Christchurch. However, Cash's old nature comes to play and we find that he's brothel keeping and in 1860 is fined and sacked from the police force. He returns to Tasmania to his family, possibly to take some money over to his wife and son. But we find also in 1862 that he moves back to New Zealand and starts that brothel keeping again. He gets caught and in the end moves back to Tasmania to be with his family in 1863 with whatever money he has made over in New Zealand. They settle down in a town called Glenorchy. This is another British settlement close to Hobart. We find in his last few years that he loses his son, also named Martin, from a heart disease. He also loses his battle with heart disease, but not before coming into contact with an author named James Lester Burke, who listens intently to Martin Cash's life story and publishes it for him. Cash seemed to live out a very interesting and varied life, from hat making to escaping penal colonies, to bush ranging, a policeman and a brothel keeper, as well as the wild women and being married, Cash had it all. It was quite a lot going on. He was one of the lucky ones who actually died in his sleep, in bed. We're really enjoying 
telling the stories of the bush rangers and we've got plenty more to come there's been books and movies and plays all written about our bush rangers cash even has a motel named after him in glenorchy and like our convicts we look back fondly on them it's unfortunate that there may have been a couple of innocents that lost their lives in the bush rangers antics but for the most part they only rebelled against the harsh conditions and the injustice that was shown them but it does give us a good understanding of what life was like back in those days we do hope you enjoyed the four-part series on van diemen's demons stay tuned for much much more don't forget to like subscribe and hit that bell because we've got 100 subscribers thank you all so much for your support and hopefully continued support here's to a thousand and sky's the limit guys